Welcome to the inaugural series of Radio Dramas, produced by the Tudor Arts and Hub in association with Writing Changes Lives, Carrick on Shore County Tipperary. This first series features three short audio plays specially created for Healthy Ireland Keep Well campaign, supporting citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic, focusing on switching off from pandemic news and staying connected with each other. The Keep Well radio plays were created entirely in a virtual realm and are inspired by residents in three residential care homes, Green Hill Carrick and Shure, Melview and St Anthony's Clonmel. Residents were invited to talk about a time in their lives when the world was turned on its head, but everything turned out okay. The residents were remotely interviewed and shared a variety of inspiring and often very personal stories of resilience and challenges overcome. Writers from Writing Changes Lives created new radio dramas based on these interviews and three, one from each care home, were chosen to go into production. The three scripts were handed over to drama directors and a cast of seven actors, all associated with the award-winning Brewery Lane Theatre Group in carrick on and rehearsals began online. The final plays were recorded using a mixture of online meetings and digital recorders delivered to the actors. The entire project was completed on virtual platforms in eight weeks during Lockdown 3, Spring 2021. For the third and final play in the Healthy Ireland Keep Well radio drama series, first broadcast on March 31st, 2021, we bring you The Magical Moon, written by Eileen Heenahan, directed by Sandra Power and performed by Pat Quinn Bulger, Walter Dunphy and Eileen Butler. This inspiring short drama tells of the imaginative connection between a mother and daughter despite enforced separation, first through illness then emigration. Sit back and enjoy. Life is full of ups and downs. People are remarkable what they survive through. But as my dad was fond of saying, you grow a backbone when life brings troubles. God knows dad had his fair share. We all did. When I look back over the years, I think, how did we manage all that? Somehow I think we just got on with it. Life was simpler back then, more innocent. We hadn't much, but you know, we were happy most of the time. I'm Molly, by the way. I was Molly O'Grady and later became Mrs Paddy Byrne. That's my husband's name. I love the sound of it even today. I was born on a Sunday on the 8th of May 1938 on a night leading into a full moon. My mother loved the moon. She told me it was a most beautiful night. It was so still. She said she, me and the moon had a special link. She said I brought great hope born in the month of Mary, mother of Jesus. There were so many Marys in our family and parish. She didn't want me to be called the same name as so many others. I was her first daughter. And I had an older brother who sadly died at birth. She decided to call me Molly. Of course, my birth certificate says I am Mary O'Grady. Sunday was a lucky day to be born, she said many times. The line goes, the child born on the Sabbath is bonny and blithe and good and gay. Now, for years I didn't know what blithe meant. One of the nuns in school told me it meant happy. And gay back then meant cheerful. Life was simpler then. I was born, of course, the year before the Second World War started. 
My family were not involved in it, but of course we were affected by it, like everyone else. Food was rationed for many years. There were coupons for everything. I didn't eat white bread until I was nine. Before that it was a brownish, greyish colour. My mother made her own bread every day, like most of the women, and used to wish for real white flour. is what I remember most through those war years, or the lack of it. It was such a dull colour and texture. God knows what they put through it to bulk it up. I love soft white flour. So pure. So light. Oh, like satin. It makes the best soda bread. It and the potatoes were the basic means back then. I learned to bake bread from my mother and she from hers before that. Funny, isn't it, how things passed down mother to daughter and on down the line. Bread making, cleaning methods, growing cabbages. And when I was a child, they said you were born under a head of cabbage. Imagine, and we believed that. Ah, having the babies was hard. Doctors few and far between, and only two midwives in the town. Our labour could go on for days. You hadn't a clue at first, but by the time I had my eighth baby, I knew a thing or two. I oh, never get over the loss of a child. I lost four and four lived. To this day, I remember each of them and how they arrived, every little detail. Molly was my first living baby, born under a bright moon. I always said, Molly, that moon is special for you and me. I got sick when she was still young, nearly 13 didn't know what was wrong with me at first. I felt tired and aches and pains, but you just have to keep going. Then I started coughing up blood. <coughs> oh, that was terrifying, terrifying. <coughs> Eventually, the doctor came. He was a kind man, I remember, with a pink rose in his lapel. He examined my whole body, not saying very much. Then he sat down and looked at me and I knew he wasn't going to have good news. My stomach lurched. He cleared his throat and said, Margaret, I think you have TB. It's doing the rounds here in Carrick. I'm very sorry, but you will have to go to hospital in Waterford and it will be for some time. I will speak to your husband. Oh, how do you leave your life and your children? That year, three of us mothers on our road did just that. All headed in the one direction to the sanatorium in Waterford. Oh, it was the saddest day I left for there. Children clinging to my legs, crying, Stay, Mammy, Mammy, stay, don't leave us, Mammy. Molly held the baby, bravely keeping herself together. I looked into her eyes and said, We are always together through the moon. Remember that. I will be looking at it and you will be looking at it at the same time. And it will mind and protect us. Deep down, I knew it would be all right, that I would recover. You know... I was really determined and strong on the inside. My husband said, Maggie, you are growing your backbone. Time in the hospital passed slowly. The days were long and ordered. Rounds of medicine, 
long periods of rest, always wondering how were they all back home. Seamus, my husband, came one week and Molly the next, so I saw one of them every week. They took the bus from Carrick. Molly brought great news of each of the children, what they were doing at school and the dinner she was making. She was even making bread with real white flour. She always mentioned the animals and wild birds and what was growing in the garden. She would bring wild flowers and grasses tied loosely together with twine. Ah, they touched my heart every time. I was so proud of her. I knew it was so hard for all of them. What we always left until last was the moon. She would say, Mummy, I was looking up at the full moon and I thought of you. I said to myself, Mummy is looking at that beautiful moon and we are together within it. The moon is indeed magical. is magical. Now I know this, but I didn't always know that. I mean, I, I knew it was a planet in the sky, and I heard somewhere it could drive people crazy who were already unwell. I, I suppose I'm a practical lad. <laughs> if anyone heard me calling myself a lad, huh? they, will, they will have some laugh at that. That's a long time, Paddy Bourne, since you were a lad. Oh, by the way, I should introduce myself. I am Paddy Bourne from Bally Richard, Carrick and Shore. I lived longer away than there. I come from good people, decent people. But there was nothing in the late 1950s in Ireland. No work, no living to be made. I'm one of six boys, and we all went to England in our turn breaking our mother's heart each time a little more. <laughs> Back then we were hardy, invincible, full of dreams. Now, back to that moon. I worked on buildings. That was tough work, but steady wages. I liked being outdoors, even in a busy city, with traffic going in all directions, morning, noon and night. At the start I couldn't sleep with it. Where are they all going, I'd ask myself. Fire brigades, ambulances, black cabs, their sirens and horns blowing right into the night. Now I miss that, the hustle and bustle, the pace of that life. Ah. Where was I? Oh, forgive me, I'm getting a bit old. My memory comes and goes a bit. I, I, I can get taken down lanes of memory that... All ending called the sex. Now, I was telling you about the moon. And as I said, I would see it in the night sky, glowing full and then fading as the month came and went. One day I was buying fags at the corner shop. The shop was owned by a hard-working Indian family called the Patels. The older man, the grandel, was wise and kind and had a great sense of humour. We struck up a friendship of sorts. He would say to me, Paddy, you must stop smoking all these cigarettes. They couldn't be good for you. <laughs> we would laugh then. Uh, we, we were both so different. Yet we shared being immigrants in the city recovering from the war, rebuilding itself as fast as possible. There were parts of this place where neither of us were welcome. We were survivors and sought out friends who supported and looked out for each other. Then one day he said, Paddy, show me your hand. I, I gave it to him somewhat reluctantly. He held it looking intently into my palm, then traced his slim fingers over the lines and said, smiling, Paddy, you are going to meet a beautiful girl soon. 
and the moon will be very special for both of you. Life moves on, you know, no matter what happens along the way. I never thought we'd get over Mammy being in hospital, but we did. She came home, and it was simply wonderful to have her back. Eugene, the baby when she left, now a toddler running around, made strange at first. But soon he was back in her lap, as if she was never anywhere but here in the kitchen. Of course, she tired easily and had to drink out of her own cup and special plate and cutlery. We were all inoculated as time passed and no one else ever got TB in our family again. So I was 17 now and my parents decided it was time for me to get work. I left school when Mammy got sick and never went back. My mother's favourite older sister, Patsy, lived in London for years. She'd always been kind to me, so she offered to take me to live with her. All her children were grown up and married now, and her husband had died a few years back. She said she'd love the company and it'd keep her young, so it was decided I was to go. At first I was excited, but as the time drew nearer, I was filled with dread. I asked my mother, how can I go so far from home and leave everything I know behind? She sat me down and explained how it was a great chance and what was there here for me in terms of jobs. I said, tears welling up in my eyes, I will be so lonely and I'll never want to leave you again. At this point, she shook her head and took me by the shoulders, looking into my eyes. And she said, when you feel sad, look at the moon. Remember, I'm looking at it too, and we will be together that way. She quickly turned her head away, but I caught a tear rolling down her cheek. It wasn't easy letting go. It was arranged that I would travel with Jack O'Byrne and his new wife, Eleanor. They lived up the road like everyone else they were going to London in search of work. We set off to Ross Lair on the train. My father saw me off, reminding me about my backbone and how it certainly would grow well in the time ahead. He pressed two pound notes into my hand. God speed, my darling girl, he hoarsely whispered. In Rosslare, we boarded the boat, and it was the first time I really saw the sea. The Burns were very kind to me. They even bought me a dinner of fish and chips and a bottle of coke. I never had that before. Luckily, I wasn't sick. We fell asleep on the train from Fishguard and woke to early morning in Paddington Station. I could hardly believe so many people could fit in one place. We met Aunt Patsy and the Burns wished me luck and promised to stay in touch. This was the starting point of my life in London. I settled well at my aunt's house. The nights were long though. And many is the clear night I spent looking at the moon, longing for home. I got work in a factory, which made of all things make-up. <laughs> we had never had make-up back home. My father would call it war paint. You don't need that tackle, he would say. <laughs> I worked on a line with ten girls roughly around my age, and it felt good having my own money. My life started to find a rhythm. On Sundays, my aunt and I would go to the park and stroll through the gardens. I, like my mother, loved the flowers, 
especially the wild ones that grew by themselves. My other love was music. Elvis, Frankie Lane, Doris Day, they all played in the background at work. My aunt had a grammar phone player too, and LPs of Count John McCormack, Ballads and Len Miller. Show bands played in dance halls every Saturday night, and the girls from work taught me to jive, quick step, and the old time walls. We used to practice on our tea break at work. My favourite dance hall was the Gresham on Holloway Road. There was always a sense of excitement and occasion. It was here I bumped into, literally bumped into Jack O'Burn and Eleanor. They were excited to see me again. Jacko said, you must meet my brother Paddy. And there before me was the most handsome man I ever met. He was tall enough and I can still see him wearing a fitted suit with drain pipe trousers and a ruler with tie. The height of fashion. His eyes sparkled and his black hair was slicked back behind his ears. Molly, may I have a dance? We floated onto the floor and it was a waltz. He was a brilliant dancer. I loved it all. The music, the lights, and most of all, when he whispered into my ear, Molly, my Irish Molly. Later we took a stroll and looked up at the night sky. What are you looking for? says he. Oh, I'm just looking at the moon, saying good night to my ma'am. Paddy gave a smile and said, Ah, the moon. Now that is something magical, after all. Ah, the Gresham Holloway Road was a great ballroom with brilliant show bands from Ireland playing every Saturday night. That's where I met the love of my life. <laughs> I'm a romantic, is really. Jacko, my brother, introduced us. Ah, she, she, was, she was special. She, she, she was beautiful. Blue eyes that drew you in. Soft curls framing her face and a smile. It would melt a stone. I, I love dancing. I still do. But my knees give me jip these days. I will never forget that first dance. The walls. It was like a key fitting into a lock. A glove fitting a hand. An instant spark between us. You know. Later while she talked to the moon. I remembered Mr. Patel's words. And smiled to myself. Ah, the rest they say is history. We walked out together through that spring into summer. Days brightening, falling deeper in love. Dancing on Saturday nights, we perfected the jive. Walks and picnics in the parks on Sundays. We had much in common, our, our shared childhoods in Carrick. And I knew her people as did my family know hers. We married quietly one Saturday morning. Our honeymoon a nice in the Imperial Hotel. <laughs> it was a full moon that night. Molly insisted on it. The whole wedding was planned around it. We settled down, living a simple but happy life. I worked hard on the buildings and moved up the ranks a bit. We made a grand home together. She made the best bread, and our small garden was full of flowers. In the back we had vegetables. Her favourites were cabbages, and she made bacon and cabbage every week. Oh, a real taste of home. Time passed. London was good to us. But you always have the yearning for home. 
As the fellow says, you can take the man out of the mountain, but you can never take the mountain out of the man. <laughs> that is how I felt about Carrick and Sleepnam on. And when a cottage came for sale at the edge of Carrick, near the river, with mountain views, I said, How about it, Moll? She said, when she could see the moon, she would settle anywhere. I am settled in the world of spirit now. I am deeply at peace. I slipped away from life while sitting on the sofa watching Tolkaru. It was a quiet death. I'm not one to make a fuss, never was. I lived a full life, although very hard at times. It was a good life. Seamus is here with me and the babies I lost. I watch over the others and their families. Every night I connect with the moon and Molly. Love never dies. you get, the faster time passes. Just whizzes by. I look back on those early years of marriage, the busyness, the hustle and bustle. I made my own home and loved it. Paddy provided well. I baked, grew flowers and later vegetables. I was fortunate. Paddy and I had good friends and continued dancing to the show bands at weekends. Joe Dolan became a firm favourite. He drew huge crowds and those nights were special and memorable even to this day. I came home to see my parents every two years at the start and then every summer. We begged them to come and stay with us. They wouldn't and answered, Sure, what would the likes of us do in London? No, too busy, too noisy. You adjust and you keep going. Mam slipped away one night watching telly. A peaceful death, the doctor said. I wish that for her. Who wouldn't? I missed her terribly though. And my father too, when he passed a few years later. Life can be hard at times. But my dad was right. You grow your backbone. You have to move on and not stay in a rut. I believe in the magic of the moon. With that I am never really lonely or alone. Sure as my mam would say, the moon is indeed magical. We have been listening to The Magical Moon, written by Eileen Heenahan and directed by Sandra Power. Molly Byrne, Neo Grady, was played by Pat Quinn Bulger. Her husband, Patty Byrne, was played by Walter Dunphy. And Molly's mother, Margaret O'Grady, was played by Eileen Butler. This play was inspired by stories generously shared by a wonderful resident in a nursing home in County Tipperary. Sound engineer and editor, Pete Smith. This play was produced by Linda Fahey, Tudor Artisan Hub, in association with Margaret O'Brien, Writing Changes Lives. This Keep Well campaign is brought to you with thanks to Healthy Ireland, an initiative of the Government of Ireland, with funding from the Healthy Ireland Fund and the Slow to Care Fund delivered by Pubble.
Thank you for listening.